Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Buddhang tamang sankhang namasami I'm very glad to welcome uh, so many people here to Amravati on this uh, lovely spring uh, Visakha Puja day. Uh, yesterday was the full moon, uh, conveniently placed on the Saturday, and uh, Sunday we have uh, uh, our grand gathering, uh, and I'm very happy that uh, the weather has been so fair and uh, welcoming, so people could sit comfortably out on the grass and enjoy the, the spring sunshine. So this is a, a day to reflect upon this uh, festival, the occasion of Visakha Puja. And as probably most people know, there are three particular significant events in the life of the Buddha that are celebrated today. It's kind of Christmas and Easter <laughs> rolled into one with a bit extra, um, uh, comparing to the, the Christian calendar. So the, the three events are the birth of the Bodhisattva, uh, Prince Siddhartha Gautama in Kapilavatu, or in Lumbini, um, and then uh, uh, growing up in Kapilavatu, his birth was in Lumbini, which is now in Nepal, on the full moon day of May. And then uh, 35 years later, after he left the household life and undertaken the, uh, the way of the Samana, a wandering uh, ascetic and yogi, uh, 35 years later, under the Bodhi tree in Bodhgaya, he realized full and complete enlightenment, became the Sama Samputta. And uh, then 45 years after that, uh, then also on the full moon day uh, of May, uh, there was the final passing away. The, the last breath of the Buddha uh, in the human world came also on the full moon day uh, of May in uh, Kusinara, uh, in Himachal Pradesh, in the, the north, also in the north of India. So all, all these, according to mythology, um, then uh, all these three, day, uh, these, these three events occurred on the full moon day of May. The, the birth, the enlightenment, and the final passing away all took place on the, the full moon day of May in this, uh, or this Visakha month in those respective years. So whether historically that, that uh, uh, happened, <laughs> uh, the uh, scholars and, and historians uh, can discuss and debate and uh, argue about these things. But uh, in, in every kind of religious tradition, uh, festivals and, and, sp and significant events, they have, I like to think of them having three particular aspects. The historical aspect, the mythological aspect, uh, the, the stories associated with that event, and also the psychological aspect, how that relates to our own mind, our own life, our own uh, way of being and day to day. So and that's a, a, a way I like to think of these, these uh, important occasions, these festivals and these significant events in the lives of the uh, great spiritual teachers and particularly in the life uh, of the Lord Buddha. So there's a, a historical, a mythological and a psychological element to all of these. So uh, again, as most people probably are familiar with the, the life story of the Buddha, he had uh, grown up in the palace in Kapilavatu, he was, a, was the crown prince, he was a warrior noble, so he'd been a soldier before he uh, was, uh, say, giving up the household life. He was a kshatriya, a, a katiya, uh, so that he was in the warrior noble caste, he was the crown prince, and so he was trained in all the, the military arts and was expected to take over the kingdom. But uh, this uh, feeling of incompleteness and dissatisfaction uh, with worldly goals uh, became stronger and stronger in his life. And then at the age of 29, just after his son Rahula was born, then uh, he chose to, to leave the palace, leave his status as a prince, uh, to leave his wife and his newborn child behind, leave everything behind, give up everything, uh, give up all his wealth, his power, his status, in order to find the, the source of freedom, the source of, of satisfaction, the, the source of uh, say peace and fulfillment in uh, in in this life. 
So it was a lot of uh, uh, sacrifice, a great uh, renunciation. So it's known uh, as a, a, such a significant event in his life, and, and we are the beneficiaries, we are the happy recipients of that great uh, and difficult gesture. I mean, walking out on his his family, his his beloved wife, his newborn child, uh, his status, his wealth, his everything he knew, walking away with nothing, just a, a few pieces of cloth that he stood up in. And, and uh, that was all. And his faith and his determination, his resolution to discover the truth uh, of the way things are. So it was an extraordinary step for him to take. But uh, uh, it was really, uh, according to his own accounts, it was, uh, it was imperative. It was the only thing he could really do. Uh, he couldn't find any kind of satisfaction. Everything became hollow and void of meaning, void of, void of substance. Um, it's uh, the stories of him making the renunciation. Uh, again, uh, you get the, the stories of him going out into Kapilavatu, driven by his charioteer Chana, and seeing a, an old person, a sick person, and a dead body, and a, a wandering, uh, a wandering seeker, a wandering yogi. Um, those stories were actually borrowed from the life his, the the, the, the um, biography, the life story of the Buddha Vipassi. In the Buddha's own lifetime, those events didn't actually happen. <laughs> they're kind of borrowed from a different story, but they're a good story. So they got woven into the, uh, the, the mythology, the customary way that these things are talked about. So, uh, and that happens a lot. And uh, what I talk about today, you'll see that happening a few times. Well, that's a good story. That's a good example. That's a good way of explaining it. Let's borrow that and plant that <laughs> there for the, for the sake of, of making, uh, making things clear. But what uh, what those seeing of those three signs, aging, sickness, and death, and then the spiritual seeker, um, that story from the life of the Buddha Vipassi many, many eons ago, 91 kalpas ago, long, 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 long time ago, um, it matches the inner reflection in the life of the, the, the Buddha himself, the Bodhisattva. Because we, what you do find in the suttas, in, the, in the, the teachings from the Pali Canon, is this inner reflection that he had at that time. He said, um, why should I, who's also who's subject to sickness and aging and death, why do I chase after other things that are also subject to aging and sickness and death? Uh, why do I do that? Uh, that's not going to bring any kind of good result. Why, do, in, why not instead seek the unailing, the unaging, the undying, the deathless? Yes. <laughs> Something, uh, an intuitive wisdom, an understanding, a, a strong feeling arose in his heart saying, yes, I'll do that. And I, and I feel that that's possible. I feel that that deathless quality, that transcendent quality is findable. And I'm not going to find it if I, if I stay wrapped up with status and money and power and, and uh, the worldly role of a, of a prince or a king running a, running a kingdom. So that internal reflection of his, they, they borrow the story from different places and <laughs> that's become the story. It's painted on walls of temples and, and it told in, sort of a, in, a, in Buddhist books, but it's a, actually, using quote marks, <laughs> it comes from the, the, the story of the Buddha Vipassi. So then he left the household life and went as, uh, became a wandering mendicant, a yogi, a very uh, stern ascetic. And for six years, he, uh, he, str he struggled and uh, he trained himself with incredible determination and uh, hardship. He, he st uh, the, the belief at that time was the more that you cause yourself discomfort and pain, the more good karma you're creating, the more you're burning off your, your obstacles. And so the more pain, the better. <laughs> and it was, well, that was the idea or the understanding that, uh, that if you are able to endure this kind of misery and, and discomfort, then you're building up tapas, spiritual strength, spiritual heat. And so, uh, and it was taken to be that, that, that's the way to enlightenment, that's the way to liberation. So, cut a long story short, um, at a certain point, uh, when the, the Bodhisattva was in, extremely emaci emaciated, you know, incredibly thin, he said he could touch the skin of his stomach and he could feel the bones of his spine. That's really skinny. <laughs> he, was so, he was so emaciated, so, uh, uh, so starved, he, he would just black out and keel over. He was uh, uh, just uh, mal uh, severely malnourished. 
And again, this intuition arose in him that, that he decided to trust. And the intuition, this inner wisdom was like, I don't think that this is uh, realistic. I don't think this is, this is valid at all. I've got this belief I've inherited from all of the other yogis and meditators around that more pain is better or the pain itself is liberating. You, but this is the limit to which pain goes. So I'm, I'm a strong person, I can really endure. This is as much pain as anyone can experience and this is not liberating. So he decided to trust that thought in his mind rather than the, the beliefs of all of the wanderers and yogis, meditators and gurus around him. And he, he decided to trust that intuition of his own heart, that sense of, this is not working. <laughs> it's like if, you've, uh, if you're driving and you're trying to get to some place and you, you realize that none of the road signs that you're, you're seeing beside the road are indicating that you're anywhere near where you're trying to get to. If you're trying to drive to Liverpool or to, to Ashford in Kent or you know, over to Bristol, it's like you know, all the signs are saying Chelmsford or South End. It's like, this is Essex. <laughs> I started out from London. This is, I'm not going in the right direction. This is not the right direction. If I keep going this way, I'm not going to get to Bristol. There's going to be a lot of water in between. <laughs> so that was the same kind of clarity, that he, and he decided to trust it. And uh, again, there are the stories you get that, uh, where it says that he was um, uh, uh, sitting by the river and he heard someone playing a veena, a, a, a sitar, a, a, an Indian lute, and that uh, hearing the sound of that musical instrument, then uh, he had this insight into um, not being too tight and not being too loose, and that uh, he, uh, that was the, the cause of of his choice to give up the, the life of, a, of an ascetic. Again, you don't find that in the Buddha's own accounts of his enlightenment. Um, it's borrowed from another place in the, in the canon, but it's a good story, it's a good example. And I feel that, yeah, it, it represents that quality very, very well. He realized, I, my strings are too tight. You know, this is, everything is too sharp and, and every, it's, all out of, it's all out of tune, it's disharmonious. I'm way, way too tight, I'm too stressed, it's, it's too tense. I need to, to loosen up. Uh, the way of indulgence, the, the palace life with lots of good food and beautiful clothes and jewelry and uh, entertainments, that was too loose, too slack, but what I'm doing now, this is way too tight. So perhaps rather than being too tight or too slack, just like a, a vena uh, or sitar or a guitar, if you tune the strings in exactly a perfect way, then you get harmony uh, between the, 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 the notes that come from the, from the strings. So that's used as an example of how he discovered the middle way. But in his own accounts, <laughs> his own stories, Actually, again, with quote marks, <laughs> um, what he says was that uh, at that time, just after he'd realized uh, more pain is not going to do any good, so what, what is the way to enlightenment? What, if that's not the way, what is the way? And then spontaneously, as he asked himself that question, the image arose of him as a young boy, about seven years old, according to the stories, and his father, King Suddhodana, was engaged in some kind of ceremony or some, um, some work with other, you know, other grown-ups. Um, uh, with a, a, uh, some, some, stories, some stories say it was a plowing festival or some kind of ceremony. But anyway, he was a little child. He wasn't involved. You know, Dad was doing some big thing. And <laughs> as a little boy, you know, go and amuse yourself. Go, go sit under a tree or something. So that uh, he was off sitting under the shade of a, of a tree. And he remembered, my mind went into this really clear, beautiful state. It was very peaceful, it was very quiet, it was very concentrated, there was, you know, uh, it was, it was um, very wholesome, and it was really pleasant, it was really enjoyable. So why am I afraid of pleasure? That kind of pleasure is completely innocent. Uh, I've been told all these years that more pain is good, pleasure is, is destructive, but actually my own experience as an innocent child with no kind of defiled or, or unskillful thoughts, what I experienced then was like, this is really pleasant, a peaceful, quiet, focused mind. That's really nice. <laughs> Maybe that's the way to enlightenment. And again, this insight arose, this, this intuition, like, yes, that's the way. And again, he had the courage 
uh, to, uh, to trust that, uh, that intuition. So he was a warrior, he was a soldier, so they, that sense of bravery and courage, that sense, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> that kind of courage is needed for soldiers and people in the military on the battlefield. Uh, but he was transferring that same kind of bravery into the spiritual uh, endeavor, the spiritual, uh, say, uh, uh, exploration, the adventure of uh, his spiritual expedition, as it were. So then he decided to, to do that. So he started eating ordinary food and went um, uh, off by himself because his companions, who were like on the sort of one rice grain a day diet, <laughs> or maybe even less, you know, two days a week have a couple of rice grains and that was it. But they, uh, they thought uh, our friend Gotama, he was our leader, he was our guide, he was the, uh, our kind of great example. He's given up on the spiritual life. He's eating ordinary food. He's accepted this rice porridge um, from, the, from the villagers. And, uh, and he's, you can actually you know, see meat on his bones. You, know, he, he, you, can't, uh, uh, you can't see all his, uh, his uh, uh, withered skin and his, uh, his, uh, you can't see his spine through his stomach anymore. So they gave up on him, his five companions um, uh, so gave up on him and thought he'd lost the way. He uh, uh, sustained their quality of confidence, determination, made his way to Bodhgaya, to the, beside the river Niranjara, and decided, oh, this is a good spot. So where Bodhgaya is in India now, in Bihar state, that's exactly uh, the place where uh, Siddhartha Gautama, the Bodhisattva, uh, arrived and thought, okay, this is the place I'm going to stay, and I'm going to stay here, and I'm going to work on this, follow this insight through until I reach uh, my goal, until I reach full and complete enlightenment. So uh, I feel this is very inspiring and powerful that uh, he was ready to trust his intuition, and he also uh, was using his own experience uh, as a measure. He was respectful to the, the spiritual guidance and teachers he'd had, but he was fundamentally using his own personal experience, what was true and what was real for him as the basic guide. So he's sitting down under the Bodhi tree, uh, uh, this uh, pipal tree, the um, ficus religiosa is the, the, the Latin name for this kind of tree, a kind of fig tree. Uh, he sat down and said, I'm not going to move from this spot. Uh, my blood can dry up, my bones can turn to dust, but I will not move from this spot until full enlightenment can be realized. And again, he had this intuition that he was close, he was on the right track. All the signs were right, you know, the Bristol... <laughs> The signs of Bristol were up ahead, you know, that, uh, spiritually speaking. That, uh, I'm, I, I feel I'm on the right track and I feel I'm very close. I feel I'm very, very close. And so it wasn't a kind of vain idea, like if one of the monks or nuns here says, I'm going to sit in my kuti, I'm going to sit on my porch, I'm going to sit under that, that uh, my favorite tree, and I'm not going to move until I've realized, realized full and complete enlightenment. It's like uh, Ajahn Chah would say, you've got to have the, um, the, the backup. You, if, you, if you try and do that and you haven't got the, uh, the spiritual wherewithal, it's like going to, buy a car and you, uh, going to buy a car and you've only got 15 baht. You, know, <laughs> you haven't got enough to buy the car. <laughs> so spiritually, the Buddha had plenty uh, of resources. He had all the paramita um, that he needed in order to fulfill that aspiration. So again, the, the stories that, that are told, uh, there are many different uh, accounts uh, of the Enlightenment. The one you find in the scriptures that the Buddha tells uh, uh, himself is that uh, during that, 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 that single night, so when he sat down, it only took one night from when he sat down and made that resolution. Uh, during the first, watch the first three hours of that night, so like from six to uh, two, no, sorry, four, uh, six to ten in the evening, uh, first four-hour batch, then he had the experience of seeing all of his past lives, one after another after another, life after life after life after life, as a, as a human being, as a deva, as an animal, as a Brahma god, and all the different events of his ma uh, manifold past lives uh, took shape before him, and he so recollected and, and refreshed all the, the lessons he'd learned from those many, many uh, lifetimes. And then in the second watch of the night, from 10 at night until 2 the next morning, his, his mind then opened up even further 
after, me more comprehensively taking in all the, the lives of all other beings, the, the, the flow of cause and effect of how beings, uh, according to their skillful and unskillful actions, how, uh, again, all beings uh, f uh, follow this flow of cause and effect and what, what happens in our lives, how nature works. And this is all just spontaneously ar arising in his mind. Then the third watch of the night, from two in the morning until dawn, till six, then uh, again it shifted gear and he saw right at the very heart of things, he saw how the, uh, the outflowing tendency of the mind, the grasping and clinging, uh, attaching tendency of the mind could stop, could be let go of. And that was when he had the insight into the Four Noble Truths, the, the truths of, of suffering, of the origin of suffering, the ending of suffering, and the way leading to the ending of suffering. So that's the, the, the heart of what the Buddha uh, talks about in most of the descriptions of the Enlightenment, not all of them, but that's the, the main description. The, the, myth, the mythology <laughs> that, uh, the, uh, uh, that we hear about and is often used, and again you find on temple paintings and is the, the stories are, are told, is um, what they call the battle with Mara. Um, again, the, those uh, those stories, uh, those encounters, they, you do find them in the scriptures, but they come from a different place. <laughs> After the Buddha's enlightenment, then uh, the, you had uh, Mara sending along his uh, his daughters, uh, Tanha, Arati, and Raga, came along to try and and throw the the Buddha off balance. And so that that is the, that is, that is a story that is told, but it. Seemingly, as far as I, I am aware, that comes from after the Enlightenment, and again the the, the efforts of Mara's daughters to to confuse or seduce or to to uh, say delude uh, the Buddha, they they all fail. But that that particular image is borrowed <laughs> and uh, and used together with other images to talk about the attack of Mara as the Buddha sits under the Bodhi tree. Again, I'm not. Uh, it's difficult to say what's history and what what is the myth and the mythology. Um, but uh, I would say it's, these are good stories, they're useful stories. But it's not exactly the way that the Buddha told the story. <laughs> which is what we have as the most reliable resource. So in the, the, myth, the mythology, the, the usual stories, uh, is that the Buddha sat down under the, under the Bodhi trees, made this firm resolution, and then Mara, the, the, Lord, of, uh, the Lord of lies, the, uh, the, the deceiver, the, uh, the embodiment of unskillfulness uh, in the world, his name literally means death, Mara means death, like uh, Amara, my name Amara uh, means deathless, Amaravati means the deathless realm. So Mara is death, Amara is deathless. So uh, Mara then detects, oh my goodness, a Buddha is about to appear in the world. This has to be stopped. Okay, all hands on deck. We need to make a, a grand effort here. And so uh, uh, Mara and his whole army shows up. So first of all, According to the, the, the myths, these, these uh, tales that we hear so often and are very useful and, and helpful tales, Mara uses the forces of desire to try and distract the Bodhisattva from this uh, process of enlightenment that he's engaged in, to try and delude him, trick him, distract him, and, and, and make the enlightenment not happen. Because Mara knows if, if a Buddha appears in the world, I'm out of a job. Well, not out of a job, but... <laughs> I'm going to have a lot of competition. It's going to be, it's going to be things are going to be really hard for me if uh, if a Buddha if, he, if a Buddha appears in the world and he succeeds in uh, realizing complete enlightenment. So first of all, he sends in uh, his daughters Tanha, Arati, and Raga, and then uh, they they conjure up uh, images of uh, of tall women, short women, uh, old women, young women, every kind of uh, shape, size, color, form, and uh, I would say. Uh, it only refers to the, the, them conjuring up female forms, but I would suggest, if it's not too heretical, they probably conjured up a few male forms and any, any other kind of form that might be attractive to, to seduce and delude and distract uh, the bodhisattva. But he is completely resolute and completely clear and that uh, he sits under the tree and is not, uh, not bothered, not not offended, not upset, and not uh, attracted, and just uh, meets the, the, the efforts of, of tanha, arati, and raga, which means craving, lechery, and boredom. 
uh, meets them with the same equanimity, recognizing, I know what this is, I know you, Mara, and it's not, not disturbed, not thrown off balance. So then desire has failed, the forces of desire have failed, so then Mara tries, okay, let's try fear and threat, so he has his 700,000 strong army of demons, and, you know, and warrior elephants and yakas and sends them all in to try and you know, attack the Buddha physically, to threaten him, challenge him. But uh, again, as many of us will have seen uh, in the paintings, the, the, the Bodhisattva sitting under the, the Bodhi tree and the army of the so demonic army gathered all around. And, uh, uh, but as they, they hurl their spears, towards the, the, the bodhisattva and uh, trying to, to, to skewer him against the tree, the spears turn into beams of light. And as they hurl rocks and, and, uh, and fire arrows, the, the, the rocks all turn into flowers and the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the arrows similarly turn into, into you know, petals and, and all fall to the ground uh, ar around the Buddha. Nothing can touch, nothing can invade that space, nothing can disturb that space under the tree of enlightenment. So then uh, f uh, uh, desire has failed, fear has failed, so then Mara produces his most uh, insidious um, uh, force, which is responsibility. You know, let's try duty. So if he can't be seduced and he can't be, he can't be intimidated, let's try emotional pressure from the family. Some of us might be familiar, <laughs> realize this is, <laughs> these are, are uh, in our terms of our psychology, this is uh, that psychological element of these stories that we can recognize, oh, these things play a lot of part in our life, the forces of desire, the forces of fear and anxiety, and the forces of responsibility. This has definitely got a, a psychological element. This is definitely represented. This is meaningful in our own life too. So Mara then sends along the image of King Suddhodana, the Buddha's father, appears before him. Again, this is in some of the stories, not all of the stories, but some of them. So the image of King Suddhodana with his sort of tears running down his, his wrinkled face and sort of gray hair, yeah, uh, and this sad kind of uh, um, longing look on his face and saying, well, you know, and uh, then the voice starts to speak and say, you know, after all of the, 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 the demon army, it's is much quieter, much calmer, much more familiar. And says, well, son, I know that you have this spiritual thing that you've undertaken and, you know, uh, you know you're a very gifted lad, you know, you're, you're um, definitely, you know, my, uh, my most um, promising son and uh, I know this spirituality, this, uh, this, this is very important to you, but, you know, the fact is that the kingdom is really going to pieces. You know, I'm getting old, and then your your half brother Nanda. Well, he's he's a good-looking lad, but you know, he's not the same. He's not as bright. He's not as good-hearted. He's not. Well, you know, no pressure. But you know, if you did decide to change your mind, and if you did feel like kind of giving up on this spirituality thing, also, you know, Yashodra, she's still waiting for you, and Rahula's doing very well. You know, he's uh, he's seven years old now, and he's he's a, he's a bright young lad. And uh, yeah, no pressure. I'm not trying to kind of blackmail you or anything. But you know, if you did feel like changing your mind, you know, there will be a place for you, and uh, and the kingdom would really flourish. And uh, and. Uh, so on and so on and so on. <laughs> so in many of our lives, I'm sure we've had similar parental pressure. Or had that kind of experience of one way, one way shape or form. Uh, but again, the Bodhisattva realizes, I know what this is. This is Mara, uh, again. And not out of disrespect to his father or not caring for the people of, of the Sakyan kingdom and uh, Kapilavatu. He knows that uh, no, this is the, uh, what I'm undertaking here, the, the, per, the process of enlightenment and the possibility of totally freeing the heart. This is something that is of radically greater importance, incalculably greater importance in this life and in, in the world. And so uh, he, uh, again, is not, not deluded, is not drawn in, it's not, he does not uh, respond to the emotional blackmail of his... Uh, of the image of, of his father, the tear, the tear-stained face of King Suddhodana doesn't doesn't make him wobble. So then Mara thinks, oh, "Darn, this is really not working." <laughs> so, uh, so the the, uh, uh, 
the Enlightenment hasn't uh, hasn't been fully realized yet. Uh, uh, but uh, Mara uh, he doesn't know what to do, so <clears throat> he just tries uh, to to kind of intimidate the, the Buddha as this final gesture. He said, "You know, uh, you might be able to resist these particular forces, but if you look at it, you know, you are really a failure." I mean, like I. I am the king of the the, uh, the Paranimit of Asavati heaven, the, the heaven of those who delight in the creations of others. I am the ruler of the highest of the sensual heavens. That's uh, I am the king of the heavens. And I am really the one who has any kind of right to claim this, uh, the Vajra seat, the, uh, the centrality in the universe. If anyone has the right to claim to be the most significant being in the universe, it's me, not, not you. I mean, you walked out on your wife and child. You couldn't hack it as a yogi. You took to eating rice porridge and ordinary food. And then you, uh, and then you sit under a tree by yourself out here in the, in the woods by this, by this river and you say, I, I'm, I'm the fully enlightened one what a joke who do you think you are you know i mean i really do have the right to call myself the king of the universe uh, don't i and then he calls his army to, to witness and says these are my witnesses and of course the seven hundred thousand strong demon army say yes indeed your majesty you are truly the ruler of the whole universe you are of the greatest importance you are the one who has the right to claim the vajra seat of the diamond throne of the ruler of the universe it is you your majesty and said, see, they're all, they all bear witness to me. They, they, they say, you know, I'm, I'm the one really is the greatest and the best and should be claiming centrality in the universe. So this is the moment uh, which is where the, the Buddha reaches down and touches the earth. And it's probably the most common uh, Buddha image in all the, the Buddhist countries uh, around the world is this what's called the Bhumispasa Mudra, the earth touching, earth witness mudra. So probably amongst all the many different kinds of Buddha images that we have in the world, that's probably the most common. Where we see that the, the Buddha, this is a samadhi or teaching Buddha image, but where the Buddha is reaching down with his right hand and touching the earth. Because what he does, is that he, uh, hearing Mara say, calling his army to witness, he reaches down and he calls forth the earth goddess, the Ga what we, in Europe we would call Gaia, in, uh, in Indian mythology she was called Dharani, in uh, Thai language Meatharani, Dharani is the name of the, the earth goddess, so he calls the earth goddess to be his witness. So she rises up, and appears uh, there in the in the the, the grove of trees in the, uh, beside the river Niranjara. She rises up, and she appears, uh, and then addresses Mara and says, "This is my true son, and he has done everything necessary to claim supremacy in all the universe. He is the one who has the right to claim the Vajra seat, the Diamond Throne, and you, Mara, are defeated." And then she unwrapped her hair, and then this produced this huge flood, this massive flood of water, and then whoosh, the flood of water uh, lifts up the whole of Mara and his armies, the daughters, the demons, <laughs> King Sudodna, the whole lot, and they all get washed away. And, uh, and after a little bit, the flood subsides, and then they all come back carrying flowers and incense and asking for forgiveness. <laughs> But uh, that is uh, how the Enlightenment is, mythologically, according to the stories, that's how the Enlightenment was completed. So uh, in terms of uh, the psychological side of it, I feel this is, is very, very significant. So when we're in our lives or practicing meditation, all of us experience those forces, the forces of desire, the forces of uh, fear, anxiety, uh, the forces of responsibility. This is not, I mean, we, we have this colorful story set in, in northern India beside the river Niranjara 2,600 and some odd years ago. But this is meaningful and why we keep celebrating these teachings and the presence of the Buddha's teaching in the world is because this maps directly onto our minds. How do you deal with sense desire? How do I relate to an attractive object? How do I relate to something that's a food that's delicious? Or a beautiful form or a color or a sound? Or, yeah, how do I relate to something that's ugly or off-putting? 
Uh, how do I relate to things that are intimidating or worrying? My, uh, my duties, my problems, uh, what people expect of me, my, my responsibilities. How do we relate to those? Parental pressure. How do we relate to uh, our, our mother's, the scowl on our mother's face when she looks at our, our exam results? <laughs> Yeah, how do we how do we relate to the the look on the boss's face, the manager, you know, when it comes to our performance review? It's like, <laughs> yeah, handing in that report. Oh, is it gonna is it gonna work? Am I gonna get a raise? Am I gonna get fired? Uh, you know, the forces of responsibility and duty, the forces of of, uh, of fear, the forces of desire. These are part of our lives. So the Buddha sitting at the Bodhisattva sitting under the Bodhi tree is the, representing the power of mindfulness and wisdom. The Buddha is the embodiment of, of mindfulness and wisdom, the, the embodiment of that awake, aware quality of the heart. So sitting under the tree with all of those the, the missiles coming towards him, the, you know, these spears turning into beams of light, it's like when the boss is really angry with you, then it's knowing that, this, the boss is really upset today. Hmm. Did I do something wrong or did I not? Or is it just his problem? <laughs> Interesting that he's, he's really upset today. Now what's the best way of handling this? So the, the, the spears are turned into beams of light. Then uh, or we meet with attractive food and lots of delicious and wonderful offerings that people brought today. Like, ooh, that's really great. That looks really delicious. And then we look down and realize, oh, my little plastic container is already brimming full. <laughs> and if I balance another little cake on top, what are, are they going to think of me <laughs> as I go by with this kind of little mountain of goodies? And, uh, and will I be able to carry it to where I'm sitting without, without the cake falling off? I mean, I'm, I haven't been spying on anyone. If you're thinking, how did he know? <laughs> this is just statistically, statistically likely rather than any kind of observation or psychic power. Uh, so the, these are forces that are at play in our lives. And the most tricky, the most uh, uh, insidious, which is a, a good word, that sort of sl slips in the back and has its influence, is that of responsibility. What I should do, what they think of me, what, what they expect of me, the mysterious they. <laughs> when we're a child, then the they is usually our parents or the school teachers. <laughs> That's kind of uh, very limited. As we grow up, then that, the mysterious they, who we assume are judging our lives, gets much, much bigger, what people think of what I look like or what my achievements are or my, my, um, my performance in the job or how I drive, you know, <laughs> all these different uh, areas of our life. So that uh, this example of the Buddha under the Bodhi tree is, uh, is very powerful and that the more that the heart can be established in mindfulness and wisdom, then the more that then nothing, none of that can touch us, the, the rocks turn into flowers and the, the spears turn into beams of light. The, uh, one of the, the, the aspects of it that I like to emphasize is that, so that the Buddha had this great insight, this great clarity had arisen in the mind of the Buddha. So he's right on the brink of total liberation, but Mara's army will not retreat. Mara refuses to retreat, and he tries this last effort to kind of shame the Buddha or make him look, make him uh, say, uh, say embarrassed at his, uh, what you could call his, uh, the, the negative or the, the, the aspects of his career that could be criticized, like leaving the family and leaving the other yogis. But Mara will not retreat until the Buddha touches the earth. So what does that mean? What, what does that tell us? So I, it, can, it can mean a variety of things. What I feel it saying is how if we make that quality of wisdom or being aware a kind of internal sort of uh, hidey hole, a kind of uh, like a, 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 a panic room that we have inside ourselves where we shut out the world it's all not self, not me, not mine, it's all empty, I'm good. So we're kind of walling off the world and trying to kind of numb our feelings. So we make a, a little safe pod of a witness or, or a, some the, uh, aspect of our mind that's knowing things, but it, it's, not, uh, uh, say it's not really connected 
with the, the whole world. It's not really connected with other beings. So in terms of meditation, we can develop a lot of concentration and make a kind of a nice little safe place for us uh, in our hearts. But, uh, but that can be very deceptive. And so uh, the, what, I, what I see in this image of the Buddha reaching down to touch the earth is that that sense of liberation and clarity was, was fully uh, developed as an internal experience, as a subjective experience inside him, um, but it wasn't connected to the world. It was like an inner quality of wisdom and transcendent vision. Um, but then reaching down to touch the earth it was a way of saying, um, uh, I was uh, born into the human world. I need to eat. I need to breathe. I'm related to other people. I, I have uh, this living world that I am a part of. So it was and not until that gesture of accepting the world of the condition, not trying to just attach to the unconditioned, the unformed, the uncreated, and, and so hide away in that little safe place, but rather when that inner realization was connected to the world of people and things, there was a, an acceptance of, of uh, and, uh, and a, a rejoicing in the, the presence of of the conditioned world, of people, of things, of, of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, when that was acknowledged and accepted, and and, uh, and the, the, literally the Buddha had to call on the mother goddess to help him <laughs> to complete his enlightenment. Your mum had to call, had to be called in to help. That might sound heretical, but this there in the mythology that the, the Buddha called upon the mother goddess. The enlightenment couldn't be completed until the mother goddess had appeared. It's kind of an interesting consideration. But it was because of that reaching out and touching the earth, it's like recognizing, yes, there's a body, it needs food, <laughs> it needs to breathe, it's related to these other beings. It's not disconnected or isolated. So I feel that's a very significant, again, psychologically for us, if we try and make our peace based on dissociation, pushing everything away, shutting everybody out, trying to get rid of all of the things that are difficult or problematic, then it's a very fragile peace, it's a very sterile peace, it's, it's not a living peace. But only when we really open the heart and accept all the people and things and the, the, uh, the aspects of the living world, we touch the earth, then in a mysterious way, by, by touching the earth, by accepting that, then that liberation is completed. We're not afraid of the conditioned world. We're not intruded upon by the conditioned world. So if you're pushing it away, you're saying, this thing is going to intrude on me. All these people, ugh, these, this stuff, ugh, this grubby world, I don't want to have to bother with it. But uh, you're, you're actually make, giving it a false solidity. When you say, yes, here it is, then the, the, the empty nature of the world can be realized. And there's a, a very beautiful phrase in the, uh, Joseph Campbell's book called uh, Oriental Mythology, where he's recounting a number of these uh, stories of the Buddha's enlightenment. And he, he expresses it in a very beautiful way. He said, at the moment of enlightenment, the Buddha broke back into the void and the world burst into bloom. So that, that completely letting go of the world resulted in the world flowering. <laughs> and uh, uh, so that at that moment of enlightenment, when Mara was defeated and the, the flood came forth from Mayor Torani's hair and uh, the, the Anuttara Samasambodhi was, was fulfilled, then there was uh, the, uh, as it said in the, um, in the sutta, the Dasasahasi Lokadatu, the, uh, the 10,000 fold uh, universal system. It wasn't just an earthquake, it was a universe quake. <laughs> the Dasa Sahasi Lokadatu, it shook and quaked and rocked. There was this kind of universal quake and this extraordinary light spread throughout the universe uh, at that moment. So that by letting go of everything completely, then that life of the Buddha became totally in tune with the whole living reality of nature. And nature responded by all the devas cheering, as we have in the Dhammachaka Sutta, it describes how the, all the devas from the, the earth spirits all through the sensual heavens up into the Brahma world, all the devas and Brahmas going, yay, satu, satu, satu. <laughs> 
so that that the result of completely letting go of the conditioned world results in, the, in all the, the aspects of the conditioned world coming into harmony and rejoicing. So I feel this is uh, not just a mythological form and it's something that we celebrate on a Visakha day, but we can recognize in our life the psychology of our own our own world, how when we uh, are, are we develop non-attachment, non-grasping, non-identification, but that manifests in being compassionate, unselfish, and uh, attuned to the time, the place, the situation. We're not making our detachment a kind of hideaway, like a little panic room, as I was saying, uh, yeah, a, a safe spot within us. Maybe one, one last story to, to share. M many, many years ago, I was leading a meditation retreat here at Amravati, and uh, uh, about the four or five days into the retreat, uh, we were having in interviews, and uh, one of the retreatants came in. And during this retreat, I'd been teaching loving kindness meditation, but uh, using the uh, focusing on the the, uh, the heart. So using the, the the rhythm of the breath as felt at the center of the chest, together with loving kindness, as a kind of uh, particular sort of uh, meditation method. And um, so this, this uh, retreat and this woman came in about after about four or five days and she said, with a big smile on her face, I'm really angry with you. And I thought, hmm, this is curious. She's saying she's really angry with me, but she's got a big smile, so what, what's the story here? And she said, uh, I'm the administrator of a large psychiatric hospital. Uh, I've been practicing Buddhist meditation for about 30 years or so. And I'm pretty, I got pretty good samadhi. And I could spend the whole day in the hospital dealing with the patients and with the other administrators and the, and the doctors. And she said, let me tell you, the patients are the easiest to deal with. <laughs> Probably a few of you in the, in the medical field might be able to relate to that. But uh, she said, uh, so I can come home and uh, I sit down to meditate and it's all gone. And I, I just focus my mind and there's this kind of beautiful, clear, open, bright space. She said, you've ruined it. <laughs> and with, again, with a big smile. So you've, you've ruined my, my beautiful, bright space. She said, I realized what, what I was doing was like climbing up to the attic and I've got this beautiful, clear, bright space in the attic with my skylights and everything is sort of pristine and flawless and I just sit up there. Mm. Meanwhile, down below in the house, there's chaos, it's raining. The, the, teen, the teens are causing their havoc, they've got all their friends around, there's you know, pizza all over the floor and, uh, and uh, video cartridges strewn over the, over the living room and my, I don't know what the heck my husband is doing. And so meanwhile, I'm, I'm up in the attic enjoying the bright space. So you've made me go down into the rest of the house. So she was figuratively talking about the chaos of the uh, teens and her husband and, and so on. But she said, I, uh, you, you've, you've forced me out of my attic retreat. <laughs> Damn you. <laughs> but again, she had a big smile on her face. She said, yeah, I realized what I've been doing with my meditation. And I was just using my samadhi to make this... this uh, uh, kind of a, a little prison cell, a bright prison cell, but it was uh, it was walled off, and that, and I realised there's a lot of work to do in the house, <laughs> a lot of tidying up, and also the you know the, the the family need my attention, and so it was a very rich discussion. It was very it was a very helpful uh, uh, little interview, but I felt that's exactly what the the touching of the earth symbolises. And uh, maybe the the last thing to share. So saying that the, the Buddha needed the, the mother goddess to, to complete the Anuttara Samasambodhi, which again I admit might sound heretical, but mythologically it's there in the story. <laughs> also mythologically, and this is uh, part of the, the stories in the canon, immediately after the enlightenment, the Buddha realized no one could, it, it could understand this. How could you explain this? This is... This is beyond words, beyond concept, beyond language, beyond anything that's describable. You could, what, could, what could you do to make people understand this? 
So his first inclination was to not to try to teach, to be a hermit, to be like a Pacheka Buddha, just a solitary Buddha, and just um, take himself away, live a, a quiet hermit's life. And then uh, uh, the Brahma, the Brahma god Sahampati, who um, was was uh, had the, the role of being the, the lord of the universe, the kind of uh, highest of the Brahma gods, and in that role of, of leadership of the Brahma deities. Uh, the um, the invitation to give the Dhamma talk recounts that story. Brahma Chaloka Dipati Sahampati, uh, the the Brahma Sahampati, Lord of the World, uh, uh, that uh, he picks up this thought in the in the mind of the newly enlightened Buddha, and and Sahampati thinks, oh no, the newly enlightened Buddha is inclined towards quiet, uh, qu uh, being being passive, being quiet, and, and, and not teaching. The world will be lost, the world will be utterly lost. So he beams down from the Brahma world and appears in front of the Buddha and so in, in the form of a, a Brahmin youth and kneels down and says, Venerable Sir, <laughs> there, uh, there are indeed um, beings that are, are filled with confusion, filled with delusion with a lot of dust in their eyes, but they're also beings with just a little dust in their eyes. And so for the sake of those with just a little bit of dust in their eyes, please can you share the understanding that you have? And so the Buddha then looks around, uh, using his uh, great powers, looks around the world and says, oh, the Brahma God is correct. There are beings with just a little dust in their eyes. So in response to that invitation, he then taught. So we are the recipients of the effect of the father god, dad, who also was part of the, the chemistry of the enlightenment and the Buddha taking up the role of being the great teacher. So uh, again, it's a mythological um, uh, image, uh, whether it ac actually happened or not, you know, who's to say, but I feel it's quite significant that in order for the Buddha to be fully self-enlightened and to become the teacher of gods and humans, both the the, uh, the mother goddess and the father goddess were both, uh, father god were kind of uh, a necessary part of the chemistry. So it's a group effort. <laughs> uh, and again, that might sound heretical or, uh, or inappropriate or offensive. So I apologize if that's the case. But uh, it's certainly worthy of consideration that, that without those two catalysts, then we wouldn't be here today. Without the uh, Mayatorani, the uh, Dharani rising up from the earth to, to be his witness, and without the Brahma Sahampati uh, asking him to teach, Amravati would not exist. We would not be gathered here in this patch of Hertfordshire in 2023. So, Tatu, for the, the, great, uh, the great efforts and astonishing wisdom and kindness of the Lord Buddha, but also for Mayatorani and for the Brahma Sahampati, that uh, this, the results of the group effort are what we inherit today. So I offer these thoughts for consideration on this occasion.